Okay, we are live. Uh, welcome to the Senate Finance Committee. We've got four bill hearings today. Uh, Chair Kelly's in the house, but she's got a couple of other things. So I'm gonna uh, chair the, uh, the four bill hearings today. And we're gonna start uh, with Senate Bill 150, Senator Augustine. And Senator, um, I, I know you may wanna make a few remarks and then maybe yield to uh, Senator Cardin, but why don't you start off? We're on Senate Bill 150. Thank you so very much, Vice Chair Feldman. Uh, I will do just that. Senate Bill 150, uh, colleagues, requires Medicaid uh, beginning January 1st, 2023, um, subject to the limitations of our state budget to provide comprehensive dental care for adults with household incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level. It makes related changes, including repealing a pilot program for limited dental coverage for adults under the Medicaid program established under Chapter 621 of 2018. The bill will take effect January 1st, 2023. Vice Chair Feldman, as we all know, we are joined by our Maryland State Senator um, Cardin, who is um, supporting this legislation. And I just, um, I appreciate the indulgence of allowing the, the Senator to, to testify, and then hopefully you will allow me to follow up with my presentation. Absolutely. Uh, Senator Cardin, we're going to yield to you and then we'll go back to uh, Senator Augustine maybe for a few more uh, remarks. So, Senator Cardin, it's all yours. Well, uh, to the Vice Chair Feldman, thank you for the courtesy of allowing me to testify before uh, a committee in the, in, the, in the Maryland General Assembly to my good friend Chairman Kelly. It's always good to be uh, with uh, my colleagues here uh, in the Maryland Senate. So, but thank you very much. And to Senator Augustine, thank you for your uh, leadership on this very important issue. I want to start by uh, uh, relating where I was yesterday. I was in my dentist's office doing my semi-annual checkup uh, in order to maintain my oral health. I have excellent insurance coverage, uh, no problems in having it uh, paid for. If it was not covered by insurance, I have the resources in order to do that. But for 750,000 Marylanders who qualify for Medicaid, that's not the case. And we need to do better. So I first want to thank the healthcare workers, uh, that uh, the, the dentists and the dental hygienists who were, were treated me this week. But those are our frontline workers. And we know that their desire is to take care of our health. And during COVID-19, they have been the frontline workers. So we thank them for being willing to show up every day and take on additional risks in order to keep us safe. But we should make their jobs easier. And healthcare policy that we do in Annapolis and Washington can very much affect their ability to do their mission to keep us healthy by insurance coverage and the availability of resources to deal with healthcare. Maryland has always been in the forefront. I cherish my days in the Maryland General Assembly. Spent 20 years as a legislator in the House of Delegates and eight years as the Speaker of the House. And I'm proud of the work that we did when I was in the Maryland General Assembly to establish the all payer rate structure. So we didn't need charity hospitals in our state. And we had, we had access for all to the highest quality hospital care. How we developed and expanded under the Affordable Care Act what we did in so many different areas to, to provide healthcare initiatives, our qualified health centers, and the list goes on and on and on. But in 2007, we were all shocked by the loss of DeMonte Drivers, a 12-year-old in Prince George's County who lost his life because he could not get access to simple dental care. An $80 tooth extraction would have saved his life. And his mom tried to get him to a dentist. And it was very challenging because of lack of coverage. Now, we took steps in Maryland as a result of the Monty Driver to provide pediatric dental care. And that was the right thing to do. And I worked with our, our late colleagues, Senator, uh, Congressman Cummings, to pass uh, coverage for our children, first under the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, and then later under the Affordable Care Act. And we were able to get the pediatric coverage under these programs but we still have a gap in adult uh, care and it is desperately needed. We all know that oral health is so instrumental to your overall health. We know that dental decay is a preventable disease, but you have to be able to afford to go to your dentist. So I introduced a, at the national level legislation that would require coverage 
for adult dental care under Medicaid. That legislation is pending. It's under consideration as part of the Build Back Better agenda. I hope we can get that done. And, and Senator Augustine's bill provides that coverage in the Maryland system. It's in partnership with the federal government because we share the costs. But I would, it's, it's something that we, we really should do. It's needed. Uh, I must tell you that it not only will help those individuals who today are having difficulty getting their dental coverage uh, costs paid for, it will save money for our healthcare system, less use of emergency rooms. And that's where a lot of our adults who do not have coverage uh, seek to get their care. It will actually make children safer because if parents have good oral health, their children are more likely to have better health care. And it's also a matter of equity in our community. When we look at those who have untreated uh, dental disease uh, among the adults, it's two to three times uh, uh, higher numbers in communities of color. So this is a matter of justice, it's a matter of cost, it's a matter of doing what's right, continuing Maryland's leadership. And I urge the committee to uh, favorably consider Senator Augustine's bill S-150. And I thank you for the courtesy of allowing me to testify. Okay, thank you, Senator Cardin. Do we have any questions for, for Senator Cardin before we move, uh, move on? Okay, uh, well, well, thank you, Senator. Uh, go on and do the business of the nation uh, from this point forward. Uh, with that, we're going to go back to Senator Augustine. Um, I think uh, you yielded to Senator Cardin for his remarks, but didn't want to uh, short drift you. So uh, I'll yield back to you, Senator Augustine. Thank you so very much, Vice Chair Feldman, and obviously grateful to Senator Cardin for his support of this legislation. Um, but I want to share my story around this legislation as well, um, colleagues. In 2019, Dr. Stephen Thomas, who many of you are, many of you know, he invited me to a Mission of Mercy event. And Vice Chair Pena Melnick was there as well, and it was held at the Xfinity Center. Uh, they were providing free dental services um, provided to our neighbors who were without dental coverage or had a benefit that was not really accessible because of certain barriers to care. They provided those services to 1,200 people over this two-day event. Um, just like they do, colleagues, at other events in, in jurisdictions, uh, your jurisdictions across the state. The people who were going to this place began to form the line to get these um, needed dental services the night before. And they waited out in the rain overnight uh, because they knew that they could be turned away, which in fact they did have to turn some people away from receiving these services, which amounted to approximately $1.5 million in dental care that was donated by the healthcare professionals um, who provided it and others who sponsored it, including insurance carriers um, with all those types of dental services. So, so Dr. Thomas, he, he led us down to the floor so we could get a sense of what the services were being provided. And, as we got near to the floor, I was stopped in my tracks because I saw some of my constituents, my neighbors, waiting. I separated from the tour and went to talk with them, and they shared with me how they had been waiting for hours, but they were getting close to desperately needed dental care that they just had no way to get taken care of other than this free clinic. And colleagues, it really just, it, it hurt me. Um, you know, one of these constituents, a block captain, in Chillum, one of my hardworking neighborhoods who is, is work disabled, but you know, still always there to help our community. And he's always there providing, um, helping with our elderly neighbors, picking up groceries, partic participates in the community cleanups. And you know, he just always lets me know what's going on on the block. And here he was um, at this clinic because he could not afford the out-of-pocket expense for dental care. And he was there, he was suffering, but he was seeking this relief uh, of this initial essential service, but it was just in a really humiliating way. I was just mortified. You know, Dr. Thomas, you know, he tried to explain to me that Maryland was one of the few states that does not mandate dental care benefits for our 800,000 adult Medicaid neighbors but I really just couldn't really fathom that that would be the case. But here we are today and I do know 
that Maryland does not mandate this essential benefit. But that's what this legislation will do. It will change that. Now, as a state, we have prioritized improving population health through innovation, innovative programs, as Senator Carter mentioned, total cost of care model, the Maryland primary care program. But in this instance, Maryland is literally just one of three states, along with Alabama and Tennessee, that does not mandate dental coverage for adults participating in Medicaid. Now, from a policy perspective, there is no dispute that providing comprehensive dental coverage will improve overall health outcomes and all aspects of individual recipients' health. Colleagues, there is a significant fiscal note, uh, but I wanna make sure that we place this in the context of the fact that we uh, invest $14 billion annually in our Medicaid population, 14 billion. This investment, which I am very supportive of, um, we're working on the re refining what it says in our fiscal note, um, because there are some places in there that we think that we can work to improve it. There are some programs, voluntary programs right now that the MCOs use that are really not being captured um, within there. And there's some utilization rates that are probably a little bit high. But with all that being said, this will require a upfront investment. Um, and this is where we as policymakers must follow the data because that data will lead to uh, overall better health outcomes and cost savings over time. So for example, we are paying extra right now um, for those who are not receiving these dental services in our chronic disease management. The evidence is clear. Regular dental care lowers the rates of chronic disease such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We're paying for it in terms of higher medical costs. All research shows in addition to better health outcomes, um, there are several thousand dollars of savings realized each year from the management uh, for those people who are suffering from chronic disease. We're paying for it in terms of um, making it harder for people to recover from substance use disorders. And the people who have dental coverage stay in treatment two times longer and are more likely to complete treatment. We're paying for it with emergency room visits. We spend over $10 million in Medicaid money each year in emergency room visits for dental conditions. And we could avoid these costs if people could just access these basic preventive services. Colleagues, as I mentioned, the MCOs who administer uh, Medicaid do voluntarily offer uh, certain dental benefits, but we miss out on the federal match that would come with this legislation. There's also no real consistency. As I mentioned, out-of-pocket uh, costs get in the way. They become a barrier um, to people being able to get these benefits. Um, and this legislation will help that. So by mandating this coverage, we'll promote greater network adequacy and access to preventive services that will lead to better overall health outcomes and a long-term reduction to the total cost of care by reducing emergency visits and mitigating chronic disease. Colleagues, I don't want our state um, to be one of those that is well known for healthcare innovation, but again, just one of three states that does not cover adult dental in Medicaid. This situation does not reflect our state's values, nor does it reflect our priorities. Colleagues, we just have to follow the data and make the decision to invest in our neighbors with a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Augustine. Any questions for the sponsor, Senator Augustine? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna to move to uh, Senator's panel, sponsor panel. Um, he's designated three witnesses. I should make uh, this point at the outset, um, we have 30 witnesses signed up and they're all signed up uh, to testify uh, favorable. So, uh, you know, uh, with that said, we're gonna limit you to two minutes um, and we're gonna start with Robin Elliott. Robin, I see you in the house. And again, you've got 20 some odd witnesses behind you all taking the same position. But with that said, uh, Robin, you've got uh, two minutes. Thank you, Senator Feldman. And thank you to Senators uh, Gazzoni and Augustine, of course, for sponsoring this legislation. Um, as you said, there are 30 people in this Zoom room ready to testify. You have in your testimony packet also dozens and dozens, perhaps even hundreds of names of organizations and individuals in support. 
I want to talk a little bit today about um, some background on the bill. Um, in your packet, you have testimony from the Maryland Dental Action Coalition in which we've included a commissioned report from a national expert on financing options for this benefit. So I just wanted to let you know that because as you're thinking about the fiscal note, I think that's an important piece of information. I also wanted to let you know that the good news is that the savings for providing adult benefits for dental is absolutely quantifiable. There are many pieces of clinically reviewed and peer reviewed research out there that show significant savings in chronic disease management and substance use disorder. One very important entity called the Health Policy Institute recognized that Maryland could save $23 million by implementing this coverage. So I wanted to let you know that those numbers are real, they're quantifiable. And lastly, I wanted to flag, there's someone here um, who was going to sign up that she uh, could not because she was ill. Um, and just wanted to read a very short excerpt from her testimony. Um, her brother, who was trying to get dental services because he's on Medicaid, got bounced to various dentists, could not get an appointment, finally got one, but the pain was unbearable. And this is from her testimony. Cody reached out to a known drug dealer, and he was a recovering substance use disorder person reached out to a known drug dealer and asked for something stronger than ibuprofen. That night, my parents found him in his bedroom. He had passed away from a fentanyl overdose. Um, this is an individual who is covered by Medicaid, but unlike Medicaid children, he's an adult, so he has no dental coverage, and he was forced to seek um, his own means of alleviating his pain. We very much um, look forward to working with the sponsors and the committee and all of the stakeholders in this Zoom room um, to ensure that this bill passes this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Elliott. Any questions for, uh, for Robin Elliott? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go to the next witness on the sponsor panel, Dr. Nakia Staley. Doctor, um, looking for you. Yes. Okay. okay. Hi. You've got two minutes, doctor. Okay. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Nakia Staley. I'm the owner of Special Care Dentistry in Landover, Maryland, in Prince George's County. I have been a Maryland Medicaid provider since 2005 uh, when I opened my practice, and I fully support uh, this bill as it helps me and my colleagues take care of the people in our community. As, as stated, 70% of our adult population live with chronic oral infection and disease that we know uh, lead to stroke, heart attack, negative pregnancy and birth outcomes, and even death. Unfortunately, I have witnessed this um, personally um, as I was treating a little boy last August. Uh, he was coming with his mother, he's eight years old. And at his last appointment, his aunt informed me mom had passed because of a tooth infection that caused her to become septic. So imagine my dismay having uh, developed a relationship with this mom and, and not being able to provide her services because she didn't have access to uh, this pilot program that could have saved her life. Um, there's also another patient, Ms. Daring. She has the program and, and has had multiple teeth pulled um, as that's the only option, uh, there's no options for teeth replacement or, or saving those teeth. Uh, and as a result, Ms. Ms. Dion has become uh, depressed. She's in psychotherapy. She's on antidepressants. She can't eat. She's lost her job and, and a host of many other things have, have been a result. Um, she's even expressed that she doesn't want to go on living. So I, yeah, I share the same sentiment of one, my good friend, Dr. Hazel Glasper, who was interest, instrumental in supporting and passing this pilot program. Uh, however, as healthcare or health physicians, we uh, very much look forward to continuing this program as well as careful examination of the uh, services covered um, and that can be provided under this program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. Any any qu uh, questions from the committee for Dr. Staley? 
Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go next to uh, Phil DeMora from the New York Department of Health. Mr. DeMora, I see you signed up informational. I don't know if uh, you had any testimony or were just here to ask, answer any questions, um, Mr. DeMora? I do have testimony. Okay, you've got two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a research scientist with the New York State Department of Health, and thank you for um, inviting me to discuss our study entitled Dental Services and Health Outcomes in the New York State Medicaid Program. So we sought to look at the relationship between the utilization of dental care and the subsequent health service utilization and costs, comparing cohorts of New York State Medicaid members ages 40 to 64 who receive preventive dental care or those receiving extractions and or treatment for dental disease or receiving no dental care. And we also did a sub-analysis uh, looking at uh, members with selective chronic diseases. And what we found was that the all-cause uh, ED and all-cause inpatient rate ratios were significantly lower for members who receive preventive dental care compared to those who receive treatment for dental disease with larger reductions in uh, inpatient admissions, particularly among members who receive preventive dental care. Um, average adjusted ED cost differences across cohorts were small and mostly not significant. However, average inpatient costs per member were significantly lower for members receiving preventive dental care with savings ranging from $263 to $380 on average per member. For each additional preventive care visit received, we found a 3% reduction in relative risk for ED visits and a 9% reduction for inpatient admissions. Each additional preventive care uh, visit significantly lowered costs for all outcomes, especially uh, for a total adjusted health care at uh, 236 and inpatient admissions at 181 on average per member. In our seven analyses with selected chronic diseases, preventive dental care was associated with lower ED and inpatient admission utilization rates and cost per member in all disease cab cohorts. Uh, savings were most pronounced for the inpatient admissions per, for members receiving preventive dental care without treatment, ranging from $539 to $1,950 on average per member. So in conclusion, we found that the utilization of preventive dental care was associated with reduced ED and inpatient rates and inpatient costs. Thank you for uh, allowing me to share our findings with you. Thank you. Maura, any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go, uh, and thank you for the, to the sponsor panel for, for all your testimony. We're gonna go now uh, to the next witness, Diane Romain. Diane Romain, Ms. Romain. Um, I do see you, there you go. Yes. Okay, you've got two minutes. Thank you. Um, I am Dr. Diane Romain, past president of the Maryland State Dental Association, presently serve on the Maryland Prescription Drug Monitoring Program as the dental representative. But also I'm a general dentist in rural Frostburg, Maryland. Daily in my practice, I see people suffering from dental problems and often because they're low income and have no insurance, I am not their first stop. Too many times they're um, one and only stop is to go where Medicaid covers their visit to a physician, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, or primary care setting or emergency rooms as we have discussed. Studies show that only half of the patients who visit an emergency department with a toothache ultimately see a dentist within six months of their ED visit. 21% with a toothache related ED visit returned to the ED for the same visit within six months, oftentimes after um, self-medicating. I'll remind you that in Maryland, prescription opioids are now the number two cause of death after fentanyl, after having surpassed heroin in 2021, even though the rates of prescribing by dentists are down. Maryland's lack of an adult dental Medicaid program contributes to the pain, poor health, shame, lost hours of work, and suffering caused by untreated dental disease. Former US Surgeon General David Satcher said more than 20 years ago that you cannot be healthy without oral health. And certainly, as we've mentioned here, we've made progress in Maryland, improving oral health for children, pregnant women, and now the dual eligibles but for working age adults and seniors in particular, um, disparities in oral health outcomes and access to dental care have widened amongst income and race. Treating dental care as essential in Medicare Maryland policy for all ages is the only way to address these challenges. And I ask for your favor favorable report on this bill. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Romaine. Any questions for the doctor? Okay, seeing none, the next witness is James Gutman. Mr. Gutman. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Kelly and uh, Vice Chair uh, Feldman. I'm Jim Gutman. I'm a Howard County resident and a member of the Executive Council and lead a healthcare advocacy volunteer for AARP Maryland. Uh, we're here to support uh, this bill and thanks Senators Augustine and Gazon for sponsoring it. You've already heard a lot of information about the financial aspects, so I won't go over that very much, just to say that in the pilot program, there are a lot of holes in that. It does not cover root canals or dentures. That's very important for people with long neglected teeth, uh, as is common for adult Medicaid uh, recipients, nor is the state's insurance exchange a good alternative since it doesn't have any beneficiary out of pocket limit for adult uh, dental coverage. And uh, the Centers for Disease Control talking about the effects of poor dental care uh, reported last year that untreated tooth decay that a condition it said is found in more than 40% of low income and non-Hispanic black adults, for instance, has a large impact on quality of life and uh, productivity. More people are unable to afford dental care than any other type of health care, CDC said, and that includes, an, and the effects include a negative impact on their ability to interview effectively for jobs. Uh, you've heard about how the effect of inadequate dental care can be huge on overall health. It allows bacteria to build up in the mouth. It potentially causes infection like abscesses that can spread to the brain. It's been associated with higher risk for cardiovascular disease, dementia, respiratory conditions, diabetes, uh, cancer, pregnancy complications, and infertility. And the list goes on, but you've already heard quite a bit of that. Uh, there's a big concern about lower income adults. I'm glad some of the private witnesses mentioned that because Medicare does not cover dental care. Uh, the CDC found that low income adults age 65 and above are more than three times as likely to have lost all of their teeth as are adults with higher incomes. Uh, SB 150 won't remedy all of those problems, but it certainly can re uh, remedy a good amount of them in an affordable way. And uh, AARP, uh, with that in mind, uh, fully believes that this is the right way to go. AARP feels all people living at or below 138% of the federal poverty level uh, and covered by Medicaid uh, should have uh, dental care. And we urge your uh, favorable report and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gutman. Chair Kelly, you've got a question and get on there. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Gutman, um, you seem to, I think, suggest if there is need for an amendment in order to broaden the base a little bit to cover a group, that a subset that isn't covered yet. Right, in the pilot program, uh, Chair Kelly, uh, there are some holes from what uh, we've been able to determine. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not qualified to give you uh, extensive details, but uh, right now it does not uh, cover root canals or dentures, and that's a big problem. It's a big expense. That'll be helpful for us, and I'm sure for the um, sponsor who is really passionate about this. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any additional questions for Mr. Gutman? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go to Matt uh, Chilantano next. Matt? Thank you, Senator Feldman. Uh, thank you, members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Matt Chilantano, uh, here today on behalf of the Alliance of Maryland Dental Plans, the State Trade Association for the Dental Insurers, and the League of Life and Health Insurers of Maryland, here in support of Senate Bill 150. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Augustine for bringing this important bill that will make a lot of or have a lot of impact on a lot of Marylanders' lives. Um, we've made tremendous progress over the past decade or so, increasing access to coverage of dental care. 55% of Americans had a dental benefit in 2009. It's now up to 80%. We have 85% of the large group market in Maryland now have a dental benefit. In the same time frame in Medicaid, we've gone from 25 million beneficiaries to over 87 million beneficiaries. We are doing a better job than we had, but there is still a tremendous group of people out there that do not have a benefit. And I would like to see us go from 47 states that cover adult benefit to 48. We think the reduction in ER costs alone is, will outweigh what the fiscal note, and we urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Celentano? Okay, seeing none. Uh, next witness is Charles Doring. Mr. Doring. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Madam Chair, uh, for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Dr. Charles Doring. I am a general dentist in Rockville, Maryland, and I'm here today representing the Maryland State Dental Association uh, in support of um, SB 150. I'm also uh, um, participate in the Maryland Medicaid program, the Maryland Healthy Smiles, uh, and I'm also uh, on the task force on oral health care in, in Maryland. Uh, to answer the chair's question, I, I provide care through the adult pilot program in Maryland Healthy Smiles. It's a $800 annual benefit. It primarily covers um, dental cleanings, exams, and extractions. There's no replacement of teeth, uh, as is stated before, root canals. And so we're looking under uh, SB 150 for comprehensive care. The timing of, of 150 here is very, very important because just released from NIH on December 21st, uh, the uh, director of the Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, um, Dr. Arena D'Souza, came out with a 790 page uh, report on oral health care in America. And I'll quote just a, a bit of that. It says, oral and medical conditions often share common risk factors. And just as medical conditions and their treatments can influence oral health, so can oral conditions and their treatment affect other health issues. So I think that just reiterates what we've already heard. And I hope you get a chance to read my uh, written testimony about a story about a patient in the, um, that, that was in the um, donated dental um, program and uh, the, the costs associated with medical treatment for uh, a dental extraction. Uh, so the MSDA wants to assure everyone here that we will work very hard for a robust network of dental team members to provide care for this new pool of patients uh, when this legislation goes into effect. But I do want to remind everyone uh, that the Maryland Healthy Smiles fee schedule has not been adjusted in over 12 years. No fee increase despite increased costs associated with providing the care, uh, particularly during COVID-19, uh, and retaining talented clinical support staff much needed to treat this pool of patients. So dentistry, uh, we are positioned to self to help in implementing this, and uh, we definitely want to be a part. So with all that being said, I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 150. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go next to Dana Kaufman. Dana, you've got two minutes. Thank you very much, Chair Feldman, members of the Senate Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Dana Kaufman and I'm here on behalf of Lifespan Network, which is a senior care provider association that represents the continuum of care for purposes of this bill that would be nursing homes and other residential Medicaid providers. Uh, when we often talk about adult dental care, we tend to think about it in the community, but I really wanted to emphasize the importance of this bill as it deals with nursing home residents and the lack of dental care that is provided to them. Um, currently, since Medicaid only covers emergency, there is no coverage for dental services such as exams or treatment when individuals need dental care or they are able to obtain dental services if they don't have an independent contract that cost is often absorbed by the nursing facility there is a very time consuming and inefficient way for the facilities to get reimbursed for that but we do believe that dental coverage for adults especially as it relates to uh, nursing facility residents is extremely important and we urge a favorable report thank you Okay, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kaufman? Okay, seeing none, next witness would be Stephen uh, Dargan. Mr. Dargan? Yes, Stephen, I see you on my screen. You gotta unmute yourself. Doing that now. Uh, thank you, Senator Feldman, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Dr. Stephen Dargan. Um, I'm a practicing dentist in Prince Frederick of 44 years. Uh, and I'm currently the president of the Maryland State Dental Association. 
And speaking on behalf of the Maryland State uh, Dental Association, we are in favor of Senate Bill 150. MSDA has advocated for years for adult uh, dental Medicaid, and we see this bill as addressing needs that we have been working for years to um, correct. Uh, I won't go over the points that my colleagues, Dr. Romaine and Dr. Uh, Doring made. However, I will say the design of the program needs to have the um, needs to engender a uh, an adequate uh, network of dental providers, and this can only be possible with the input from the practicing dentists who will be part of that network. Uh, dentists know best what comprehensive care involves for our patients. Uh, provider registration and renewals must be seamless, and reimbursement must be sufficient to attract and retain these uh, dental providers. Uh, we cannot treat patients at a loss. As Dr. Doring said, uh, the Healthy Smiles uh, program has not uh, had a fee increase in 12 years. Um, as far as a seamless program uh, or uh, administration of the program, I'm a perfect example. My experience was uh, I was a Healthy Smiles uh, provider. And then uh, when I had to close my practice, I became an independent contractor uh, in another practice in Prince Frederick. And um, my experience in trying to re-register and reapply to be a provider in the Healthy Smiles program and the uh, pilot program uh, met nothing but barriers. And uh, this has to be corrected and uh, again, um, uh, uh, essentially shows that this uh, registration administration must be done properly. Uh, again, I want to thank you for this opportunity and um, I and MSDA is very strong in support of this um, Senate Bill 150. Thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. Any questions for Dr. Dargan? Seeing none, next witness will be Gretchen Graves. Um, Ms. Graves. Gretchen Graves. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, wonderful. You've got, you, you've got two minutes. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Feldman and members of the committee for giving me a chance to speak today. My name is Gretchen Graves. I live in Hagerstown. What did it mean to me to get the 2019 dental waiver? The waiver represented freedom, hope, and a lifting of the weight of trying to find an affordable dental home, especially after our Washington County Health Department closed its only sliding scale dental office. As a recently divorced mom suffering from depression, receiving my enrollment card eased some of my anxiety about my dental health. It had been 20 years since I had a job offering dental insurance. There were many positions I worked just under full time where the company didn't have to offer me health insurance. And this forced me to go much longer periods of time between cleanings simply because I struggled to find an affordable dental home. I have more fillings now, I'm convinced, because of not having regular care. When I was pregnant with my son in 2013, I was able to see a dentist through MTIP or Healthy Smiles, I believe the program was called. I still remember my excitement at being covered and also my feelings when the dental program ended after having my little boy. I had so many postpartum emotions. I felt like nobody cared about me as a new mom and my dental care. At the same time, I was so grateful my son had dental coverage through Healthy Smiles. I've always wanted to be the best role model I can be for my son. I feel that having the opportunity to see a dentist on a regular basis allows me the chance to show him that I am practicing what I preach about how important it is to brush and floss and see the dentist for regular cleanings. I've always been proud of Maryland for what I see as, a progress, as its progressiveness. When I found out Maryland is only one of three states not to offer to its Medicare recipients dental coverage, I see this as a wonderful opportunity to correct this oversight embarrassment. Thank, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong page here. Um, I'm proud of my smile, the dental care I receive, and I want the same dental coverage for others. As a single mom with mental health issues, this coverage takes a huge weight off of my shoulders and gives me hope. I come before you today to plead for all the other Medicare recipients who do not yet have this basic need, and I mean basic need, 
accidental benefit. And I implore you to be on the right side of Maryland history. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Graves. Any, any questions for Ms. Graves from, from the committee? Okay, seeing none, uh, our next witness is Ashley Black. Ms. Black? Yes, good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Ashley Black. I lead the Access to Health and Public Benefits Project at the Public Justice Center. You have our written testimony. Um, we've been invested in dental care uh, advocacy for low-income patients since our client's um, child, who was 12 years old, Diamante Driver, died of a tooth infection in 2007. We were strong supporters of expanding Medicaid to cover children, and we are proud to support um, that same extension of coverage to adults. Um, we, uh, wait one second. This is something that low-income Marylanders have been waiting for for a very long time. Many of our clients have not been able to access dental care, and what could have been a minor dental problem has now turned into a chronic dental issue accompanied by chronic pain. They're often put in the position of having to decline necessary dental care when they can't afford it out of pocket and must rely on emergency care, which is not a permanent solution as we know. Um, Senate Bill 150 would make, it a uh, make a tremendous difference in the health status and quality of life for our clients, including being able to eat without pain, um, attaining different work opportunities and socializing. In closing, when, we, when I started at PJC in 2018, we held listening sessions in the community with low income community members about accessing, um, about barriers to accessing healthcare. Community members overwhelmingly supported Medicaid having a dental benefit. And I'll leave you with a quote that resonated with me from a community member who was experiencing chronic dental pain. He said, Medicaid does not have dental care for adults. I've been in pain every day for a long time and I can't figure out what's wrong with me because I can't afford to. Thank you for your time and we urge you to pass this bill. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Black, for your testimony. Any questions uh, for uh, Ms. Black? Okay, seeing none, our next witness is Melanie Bell. Ms. Bell? Hello. Hello, you've got Ms. Ms. Be Dr. Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell, you've got uh, two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Vice Chair and members of the Senate Finance Committee. I'm Dr. Melanie Bell, Vice President of the Maryland Nurses Association. The MA strongly supports Senate Bill 150, a Maryland Medical Assistance Program dental coverage for adults, addressing critical gaps in Medicaid coverage by establishing an adult dental program. Oral health is essential to one's overall physical and mental health. It is imperative that humans of all ages receive adequate preventive dental care at a minimum of every six months to accompany routine oral care practices, especially as an adult, due to diet, medication, and natural body changes. If one doesn't have access to routine cleanings and examinations, they are vulnerable to disease processes, which can lead to, which can affect the brain, cardiovascular, and gastrointestinal systems. Furthermore, lack of proper oral health may also cause loose or missing teeth and pain, leading to malnutrition, because of the inability to consume or chew foods properly, leading to dysphagia. Lastly, body image disturbances, because one feels they cannot smile, leading to mental health challenges such as depression and anxiety. The focus is to continue achieving public health goals and access to care. Research demonstrates that dental coverage lowers healthcare costs, as mentioned before, for people with chronic diseases such as diabetes, cerebral vascular disease, and coronary artery disease. Adding dental coverage provides additional tools to keep people healthy and thriving. Thus, we ask for a favorable vote on this legislation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bell, for your testimony. Any, any questions for, for Dr. Bell? Okay, seeing that, we're gonna go next to Dr. Parita Patel. Dr. Patel? Good afternoon, Chair Kelly. I'm Dr. Paritha Patel, the Dental Director of Healthcare for the Homeless, and we stand in strong support of Senate Bill 150, legislation that would authorize Medicaid coverage for adult dental care in, Med in Maryland. Healthcare for the Homeless is a federally qualified health center that provides dental services. Every day, I see the tremendous need for and life-changing impact of dental care. Our client, Anthony, came to us one fall with a few broken teeth and infections in his mouth. He shared with me that he lost his right arm while at work as a young adult, which propelled him into decades of addiction and homelessness. Now in recovery, he was having difficulty gaining weight because he could not chew with the remaining teeth he had. 
We made Anthony a set of dentures, and when it came time for him to try on his new smile, Anthony looked at his reflection, chuckled, and said, I haven't seen this guy in years. A reminder that oral health absolutely impacts mental health. During a follow-up appointment three weeks later, Anthony was thrilled to report that he had gained 30 pounds. Tell her what you told me, my assistant added. Anthony replied, as soon as I got the dentures, I went home and ate eight granola bars. He saw my reaction and added, they had nuts. I couldn't chew them before. In addition, oral health affects overall health, and Anthony has a history of diabetes and hypertension, both of which are better controlled now that the infections in his gums have resolved. Unfortunately, though, not every story ends this way. There are thousands of people experiencing homelessness who are unable to access dental care. We have tried to meet those needs, but we are limited in our ability to meet them. Dental care for adults is largely uncovered by Medicaid, which is the only coverage most of our clients have. In a typical year, our dental services cost about $1.4 million. Medicaid currently pays for less than 4% of that total. Grants and donations make up the rest. This is not a sustainable way to fund this most basic and essential form of health care. This session, we have a chance to change that with Senate Bill 150, a bill that will help ensure the sustainability of programs like ours so that we can continue to provide care for members of our community like Anthony. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Any questions for Dr. Patel? Okay, seeing none, next witness is Susan Stewart. Ms. Stewart. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of SB 150. Um, I am the executive director of the Area Health Education Center West, uh, known as AHEC West. Uh, we are located in Cumberland and obviously we serve the Western counties. Um, we have a number of programs there. However, I'm here to talk about HealthRight, which is our emergency dental access program. It's been an, at AHEC West for four years, but it was a standalone organization prior to that for a number of years. And in the past, I mean, we serve low income adults and help them get access to dental care when they need it. Um, so we've served 1200 people in four years. And without HealthRight, 1200 people would not have gotten the care they needed. And um, those people are going to the emergency department. They have complicating health factors as well and not getting their oral health care taken care of makes that even worse. Um, I wanna share with you that every single day people come through our doors every day and say, I've been in pain for years um, and I, I, don't, I don't have adequate coverage or I don't have any coverage. So we have about 53% of the people who come through our doors have Medicaid, um, but they still can't afford their treatment, most of them. We do work with health departments and private practice dentists and oral surgeons um, who, are, who are heroes in our community. They give of themselves and they, they give us uh, discounted prices. But, but anyway, so people say that coming through the doors and they're very grateful. Some people come in with their faces swollen. Um, we had a veteran who um, told us his story about in 2010, he had oral cancer. Well, the treatment for the cancer uh, really helped deteriorate his teeth. Um, and he was talking about how much pain he was in and ultimately one of his teeth shattered. So he came to health right and he got help. Um, and he was very grateful for that. And he said that without it, he would still be in pain. And he gave us this uh, testimony in testimonial in um, 2018. So, um, I mean, this is just a little bit of the people that we serve and we're funded. We're funded by the state, by the city, cities. I mean, the Community Health Resources Commission funds us, the Rural Maryland Council funds us, uh, foundations fund us, et cetera. It goes on. We just keep trying to bring money in to help people get out of pain. Um, we've also been involved in denture programs where we help people get dentures. Um, but anyway, we very much um, would appreciate a favorable report on this bill. And we really believe that we need to put the mouth back into the body. Um, this is an essential component of healthcare and we'd like to see the budgetary support that would help build an adequate uh, participation, broader network by dentists. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stewart. Any questions for uh, Susan Stewart, witness? Okay, seeing none. Uh, the next witness signed up is Ashley Carruthers, but I have uh, my senses. I understand that she may no longer be here on the Zoom call, uh, but I'm going to go once, twice, three times. Is Miss Ashley Carruthers um, here on the phone call? Okay, Ashley is not here. I've got confirmation. We're going to 
The next witness, Donna Clark, signed up. I also uh, believe uh, it's no longer on, on the call. Um, once, twice, three times. I believe uh, Donna Clark, who signed up, has also uh, uh, vacated the premises here. So we're going to go next to Nancy Rosen Cohen is the next witness signed up. Ms. Cohen. Uh, thank you. I'm Dr. Nancy Rosen Cohen, Executive Director of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence for the state of Maryland. We fully support the passage of Senate Bill 150 to create the comprehensive dental benefit. And I thank all the legislators and the leadership for paying attention to this and bringing this to our attention. As has said by many people before me, there is obviously a strong relationship between oral health and substance use disorders. So people who cannot access care for painful problems may start self-medicating. Then this can lead to an addiction to opioids, whether they're prescribed or obtained illegally. The use of other substances, including tobacco, e-cigarette vapors, and methyl methamphetamines has a direct correlation with poor health, poor oral health. A recent study by the Journal of American Dental Association shows comprehensive oral health care improves addiction treatment outcomes. Finally, as said before, poor oral health can have a negative impact on people's recovery. When a person is unable to get care, pain resulting from dental or gum problems can lead to relapse. And when people have poor dental conditions, the lack of self-confidence can prove to be barriers to good nutrition and even obtaining employment. So I definitely feel it's time for Maryland to join the other 47 states in this country that already provide dental benefits to adults enrolled in Medicaid. Thank you and we urge your support of Senate Bill 150. Okay, thank you, doctor. Any questions for Dr. Rosenkohl? Okay, seeing none, the next witness uh, signed up was Vicki Walters, but I understand uh, Ms. Walters is no longer on the Zoom call. So going once, twice, three times, uh, Ms. Walters not here. Gonna go to the next witness, uh, Nancy Turner. Nancy Turner. Hello. Good afternoon, Senators. Thank you for taking the time to hear my support of Senate Bill 150, providing dental coverage to Medicaid recipients. I've been a registered nurse in the substance abuse and mental health field since 2001. And during that time, the greatest barrier I've seen to achieving optimal health for my patients has been the lack of oral health. Patients with substance abuse disorders and mental health disorders that lack dental care have severe infections in their mouth for years of, of use and revert to using um, opioids for treating their pain. Presently, patients are using fentanyl to deal with their pain because it's a cheaper alternative than anything that they have, which of course increases overdose potential exponentially. So we're not seeing patients use anything other than fentanyl in the, in the substance abuse field at this point. So overdoses are occurring exponentially. Um, everybody else is pretty much on these calls with doctors and others have, have said exactly what I have said. Uh, health is optimal with oral health. So there's not much more that I can say other than being a nurse in the field. I'm the one who has to um, stroke their hair and tell them that there's no hope for them until there is coverage provided by this bill. So I urge you to support Senate Bill 150. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Turner? Okay, seeing none, next witness is Kathleen Hayes. Ms. Hayes? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair Kelly and Vice Chair Feldman for allowing me to testify today. And thank you to Senators Augustine and Gazzoni for introducing this bill. My name is Kathleen Hayes, and I'm a social work student at the University of Maryland and an intern at Maryland Citizens Health Initiative. As a native Marylander, I am proud to live in a state that is a leader in healthcare. So I was shocked when I learned that we are only one of three states that does not offer any dental health coverage to adults under 133% of the federal poverty level. Uh, I echo what others have said about the physical and mental health issues that can arise from untreated dental disease. And I add that providing dental coverage is also a health equity issue since people of co color have significantly higher rates of tooth decay. 
Passing SB 150 is crucial to provide Marylanders the care they need and deserve, and I urge a favorable report. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hayes. Any questions for Ms. Hayes? Okay, seeing none, the next uh, witness is Dan Martin. Mr. Martin? Uh, Senator Feldman, thank you very much. Members of the Finance Committee, it's great to be with you here in support of Senate Bill 150. Uh, my name is Dan Martin with the Mental Health Association of Maryland. I'm also representing the Maryland Behavioral Health Coalition today, uh, which is a coalition now of upwards of uh, 100 statewide and local organizations across the state, all working to improve access to mental health and substance use disorder services. And, and our members uh, uh, include um, consumer and family advocacy organizations, peer-run organizations, um, community behavioral health providers, professional associations, hospitals, health systems, and more. And there is consensus across our entire coalition about the need for this bill. And it's not hard to understand why. Um, you've already heard uh, stories from and, and testimony from a number of witnesses about the um, interconnection between oral health and behavioral health. So I won't repeat all of those, uh, those testimonies, but just say that, you know, um, our failure, failure to provide Medicaid coverage for dental health services results in far too many Marylanders who are subject to oral health issues and dental pain that can make it difficult to obtain employment and can compound or, or adversely impact recovery from a mental health or substance use disorder. And for that reason, um, Mental Health Association and the Maryland Behavioral Health Coalition are both in strong support of Senate Bill 150 and, and urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Any questions for Mr. Martin? Seeing none, next witness is Harold Goodman. Dr. Goodman, I believe. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair Feldman and committee members. I'm Dr. Harry Goodman, I'm a public health dentist and I'm the former director of the Office of Oral Health at the Maryland Department of Health, having retired in 2016 and here to support SB 150. Uh, this important bill reminds me of, my, of legislation from my life as the dental director when our federal legislators, our governor um, and the department partnered with you to make important changes regarding low access to dental services for poor Maryland children. This was in response to the needless death from a dental infection in a 12 year old Maryland child, Diamante Driver. Thanks to your leadership, Maryland went from worst to first in becoming a national leader in oral health for children. But now do we have to wait for an adult to suffer the same fate as Diamante before we do anything? We can assume adults likely have died from physical and behavioral illnesses related to oral disease, but the connection is not made. Oral health is health. And as the nation recovers from the COVID pandemic, oral health coverage is a critical cog in our healthcare system. But without oral health coverage, it only perpetuates many health and economic inequities, especially for those communities most affected by the COVID pandemic. So why are Maryland adults excluded from dental coverage in our state Medicaid program, one of only three states that doesn't systematically cover adults? It makes little sense. Oral disease is bad enough in the mouth, but it also contributes to other chronic diseases, and yes, it can also kill. Adults are the makeup of our economic fabric, but rather than be a buttress for our economy, they can be a drag on it if they have to use hospital emergency departments for their dental care and are forced to use opiates, um, other drugs, and alcohol to ease their dental pain. As I said before the legislature years ago about children, this should not happen anywhere, anywhere, let alone in one of the wealthiest states in the country. SB 150 will also benefit adults 65 and older, will have less oral disease when they lose their Medicaid coverage. And also children will be more likely to receive dental care if their caregiver or parent also receives dental care. Please, it makes no sense when a Maryland adult takes their child to the dentist, but only the child can be seen. Let's get the parent out of the waiting room and into the dental chair to receive the care they need to improve their health and well being, as well as our economy. Despite our achievements with children, we cannot pride ourselves as a leading state in oral health without adult dental coverage. I strongly urge you to support SB 150. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Goodman. Any questions for uh, Dr. Goodman? Hmm. Seeing none, uh, our next witness is Eileen Cervantes Del Toro. Uh, Good afternoon and thank you all for having me yeah. today. My name is Eileen Cervantes Del Toro and I'm a registered dietitian and the nutrition services manager at Movable Feast. Movable Feast is a local nonprofit organization that makes and delivers nutritious meals to those with chronic illnesses. Myself, along with the other dietitians on staff, also provide nutritional counseling and help our clients set goals that are designed to improve their quality of life and overall health. One of the issues that we commonly run into is that of poor dentition. Um, the issues range 
from dentures that no longer fit properly to clients who have severe tooth decay. Our records indicate that only about 25% of the clients have engaged in routine dental care recently. Many of them report access as the number one barrier. Those with chewing difficulties, as has been brought up earlier, may experience a loss of appetite as a client's, uh, client may feel limited to choose only soft foods. This can cause unintended weight loss, significantly impact one's ability to heal, and even worsen one's pre-existing health conditions. One such client that I would like to speak about, um, she saw a dietitian in August, 78-year-old 70, female, who reported a significant weight loss. She told the dietitian that she was mostly eating pasta and soft vegetables because she was experiencing severe tooth pain. When I spoke again with her recently, earlier this month, in fact, her dental issues had still not been resolved. And she was relying almost entirely on oral nutrition supplements, such as Ensure, to meet her needs. While Ensure can be a, a good short term solution, this client's situation is complicated by the fact that she also has congestive heart failure. For those living with heart failure, they often have to limit their fluid um, intake. And as a result, her heavy reliance on such beverages puts her at greater risk for fluid overload and ultimately being readmitted to the hospital. Routine access to dental care, such as SB 150 would provide, would help to ameliorate unintended consequences that this client and many others um, have faced, both with their nutrition and their health. Thus, on behalf of Movable Feast and the clients we serve, we urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. Any, any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go back. Uh, one of the witnesses we went over who had signed up ran into a technical problem which booted her off the Zoom. So we're gonna give her an opportunity to testify. Donna Clark, Ms. Clark, um, I know you're back on the call. You ran into yes, I am. Problems. So you've got two minutes and then we'll move uh, on to the other witnesses. So Ms. Clark, it's all yours, two minutes. My okay. name is Donna Clark. I am the director of HOPE, uh, Help and Outreach Point of Entry, a nonprofit agency that provides uh, financial assistance to those in need of health care. In 2015, we began an uh, adult dental outreach to the community. And since that time, we have assisted over 100 people at an average of $373 per person to obtain dental care. We get this grant, this money through grants and donations from the community. And since 2015, we have actually spent close to $300,000 helping the people in our community obtain dental health care. We um, have since December promised out $12,000 in assistance to people in need of basic dental care, dental care that goes beyond what medical assistance covers at a max of $750 per person that does not cover enough to help people regain good dental health, which in turn affects their general health. SB 150 would help those people uh, with head and neck cancer. We have spent close to $80,000 helping people have teeth removed that are affected uh, with decay and disease so that they can then begin their radiation treatment. Our community is suffering both with dental health and their physical health as they are unable to obtain good dental care and requiring large sums of dollars from the community draining on public funds. Please consider passing SB 150. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Any questions for Ms. Clark? Okay, seeing none, um, go back to the list. Uh, next witness, Ann Seacott. Ms. Seacott. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all, um, members of finance. My name is Ann Seacott, um, here today representing the National Association of Social Workers, the Maryland chapter. You also have written testimony from several other uh, organizations I work with, including the Maryland DC Society of Addiction Medicine, as well as the Maryland Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence. Um, I will say that there is no subject that has uh, as immediate and uniformly and enthusiastic support uh, from, from the organizations I work with than dental coverage. Uh, speaking specifically on behalf of NASW, social workers work every day with clients trying to meet their most basic needs 
and all the way to their most, uh, to some very special needs that they have. And this is by far, dental coverage is by far uh, the one of the most difficult things that they are able to find for their clients. Um, when you look at the fiscal note, please do pay attention to the research, much of which has been provided to you in, in the written testimony um, about uh, the savings that, that occur when people get their dental coverage. Um, it's the money from ERs and hospital stays and medical uh, uh, issues. It's the money saved because we see now that dental coverage uh, can result in more positive outcomes when people are in addiction treatment. We know that people are better able to obtain jobs and that means more revenue um, in the taxes that they're able, when, when either income taxes, sales taxes, et cetera. Uh, we know that um, all of the things have been talked about today around uh, charity care, around grant funds to fill in these gaps. Those resources can now be shifted to something else uh, with passage of this bill. Please don't forget you're saving lives. Um, it's the horrible stories that, that we've known for years, um, like Diamante Driver, um, the, the story that was shared at the beginning uh, of this hearing about um, the, the man who turned to illegal drugs to mask the pain and died of an overdose. This really does save people's lives. It saves money. It makes a lot of sense. And we ask for your support for this wonderful piece of legislation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Seacott. Any questions for Ann Seacott? Seeing none, our next witness is Dr. Ricardo uh, Kimbers. Dr. Kimbers. Is Dr. Uh, yes, I see you on there. Okay, I'm Dr. Here. Uh, two I'm here. Minutes. Wait a minute. Okay. Um, there I am. There you go. Okay, okay yeah, Dr. I, I had uh, put in a written testimony, so I was not uh, going to be able to uh, do a live testimony, but I can still uh, just add a few things that have been said. Um, you can read my written testimony, it is there for you. But um, a lot of people have said uh, quite a few things that are true. And as you can see that all of these people are here in support of this greatly needed bill. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that we are one of three states that have not, um, that has not uh, uh, given any support to uh, adults over the age of 21. Um, I'm a second generation dentist. I, I had the privilege of practicing with my father uh, for about nine years. Uh, and I've been in practice for over 37 years. And uh, I've been, a mem uh, been uh, accepting Medicaid ever since I uh, became a dentist in 1983. And I just strongly support this bill. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way my father and he is deceased now, would not have it any other way that we would have to support our community. I've been in the city of Baltimore all of my life, born and raised here. And uh, Dr. Kelly, I'm glad to see you and hello to you. Um, and if there's anything that anyone needs to know about somebody in the trenches that's on this uh, committee, I will be more than happy to reach out and speak to any of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. Any questions for Dr. Kimbers? Okay, seeing none. Our next witness signed up is Liana uh, Brown. Ms. Brown? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Liana Brown. I'm here today as a, as a representative of People on the Go. I am also a medical assistant participant. I am here to testify in support of SB 150, Medical Assistance Dental Coverage Program for Adults. I have been a participant in the Maryland Medical Assistance Program Dental Coverage for Adults Pilots Program since the beginning in June of 2019. I'm only granted $800 per year towards all my dental needs, which only covers two cleanings and simple extractions. I am on Social Security and I could not afford major dental work if I needed it. A lot of dental facilities do not accept the Maryland Medical Assistance Program dental coverage, which really makes it hard to find a good dentist that you feel comfortable with and is convenient for me to get to. As of 2019, this program has not provided me enough coverage to cover my dental needs. 
with the rising cost of the dental procedures, I feel that a substantial increase will allow more people with disabilities to take better care of their teeth. We are looking forward for a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Brown. Any questions for uh, the witness, Ms. Brown? Okay, seeing none. The next witness we're gonna go is to Elizabeth Weglin. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, it's Elizabeth Wegline on behalf of the United Wegline. States. Elizabeth Wegline. Sorry. Thank you very much. Here on behalf of the United Seniors of Maryland, and we're here to support the amendment from AARP for the um, addition for denture care. Even as our seniors age, they may change their weight, they may change their conditions, um, but most importantly, we want to make sure that we are looking holistically in supporting our aging citizens in Maryland. This bill addresses that, and I think we've had some excellent experts talking more about it. So we wanna just pass our good support and we hope that the committee uh, responds favorably in support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, any questions for Ms. Ms. Wegline? Okay, seeing none, our next witness is Mukta Bain. Thank you. Is, is, is our witness Mukta Bain here in the house? I believe saw her somewhere. Uh, hi, yes. Hi, okay. good afternoon. My name is Mukta Bain and I'm here representing Maryland Public Health Association. Um, Madam Chair and members of Senate Finance Committee, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify in support of SB 150. Um, as a young adult with student debt, I had the opportunity to have free dental coverage through Maryland Medicaid. And not many people were as privileged as to get access to dental coverage. So I felt less anxious because I knew my oral health was taken care for. Oral health is a complex part of overall health. So it is very important that we make sure Marylanders can access to dental care. Uh, thank you for the community for your recognized effort toward improving access to quali quality, affordable care for Marylanders. Um, this bill is very important for Marylanders to remain a leader in healthcare. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Ms. Bain? Okay, seeing none, the final witness on Senate Bill 150 is Caitlin McDonough. Ms. McDonough, you've got two Good minutes. Good afternoon, committee uh, chair and vice chair and members of the committee. My name is Caitlin McDonough here today on behalf of Benefis, and I join with all the fellow witnesses today in support of Senate Bill 150. Benefis is a dental support organization that provides non-clinical support to nine dental practices in Maryland that specialize in Medicaid dental services. We serve populations of approximately 85 to 90% Medicaid and combined those practices are one of the largest Medicaid dental providers in the state, providing approximately 20% of the state's overall dental services and about 40% in the Baltimore region. And as a major Medicaid dental provider, we strongly support the establishment of this benefit for all the reasons that have already been stated. But I am going to take the opportunity today to note one thing that I hope that the state and the committee take into consideration as they move forward with implementation of this program, and that's Medicaid dental reimbursement rates. Um, if you don't have adequate rate structure to support the providers who are providing these services, they're not going to be able to keep up with the increased demand under the new benefit. And unfortunately, we have not seen a comprehensive increase in Maryland's Medicaid dental rates in more than a decade. And those rates are lagging far behind commercial dental rates and even further behind medical uh, Medicaid rates, as, as we heard Senator Augustine discuss earlier. Um, and that makes it very difficult for us to maintain our staff. And that includes dentists, dental hygienists, dental assistants, uh, who are basically uh, reimbursed at about 60% on the dollar for these rates compar compared to commercial rates. I know this committee already has a pretty in-depth understanding of what happens when we don't support our providers with adequate, adequate rates, and they just can't compensate their staff in the ways that they need to to keep 
them open and able to see patients in a timely manner. Um, those low reimbursement rates are now combined with increased demand following the shutdown of dental practices during the shutdown and also increased cost due to inflation and PPE, which is not also not covered by Medicaid. So while we are in full support of this expansion of services, we hope to have a seat at the table as a major provider in talking about that rate component, uh, similar to what we've seen where they've done this expansion in other states. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any questions for uh, Ms. McDonough? Okay, seeing none, that uh, concludes the testimony on Senate Bill 150. And we're gonna move on to the next bill, Senate Bill 2. Senator Augustine, we're back to you. This is Augustine Day in the Senate Finance Committee. Thank you, um, Vice Chair Feldman, and thank you everyone uh, for bearing with uh, all that wonderful testimony on the previous bill. I'm now before you with Senate Bill 2, which is the Mental Health Law Petitions for Emergency Evaluation Electronic Record, uh, requesting a favorable report as amended. Colleagues, this is really uh, simply a modernization legislation um, without changing anything with regard to the process of petitions for emergency evaluation. Current law does not specify whether approved petitions may uh, be must be received by a peace officer or emergency facility in person, or if they can be received in the form of an electronic record, such as an email or a fax. Because it has become established practice to deliver approved petitions in person only, um, this process can really take a long time. Just to give you an example, uh, colleagues, it, it, an individual is in a crisis in a jurisdiction, let's say Frederick, Frederick County, um, and an, an emergency petition is ordered, but the individual has now gone to Calvert County, for example. Um, the, the issue is that the uh, sheriff who um, must obtain this order would have to go all the way up to um, Frederick County to uh, physically get uh, a copy of the order. And in fact, the courts have modernized themselves to the point where it's already in an electronic form and they have to take it from the electronic form and actually print it out in order for the sheriff to get that, um, to get that petition. And then the sheriff, of course, has to take that petition back get to the individual uh, and then get that person um, uh, to a facility for evaluation and treatment. And so what this um, piece of legislation does is um, it basically just really clarifies um, that a uh, law enforcement and or emergency facilities are allowed to receive approved petitions for emergency evaluation in the form of an electronic record. Now we did work during the interim with all of the stakeholders to gain agreement uh, on this piece of legislation. Uh, and I do have a sponsor amendment, which is in with what you have. Um, when that was from the courts, um, the courts uh, had their concern and they expressed concern that the bill could be interpreted to permit electronic filing of the petition. But that is not the intent. Um, the statutory change is solely to allow electronic transmission of, transmission of the endorsed order rather than requiring the peace officer to have a paper copy or original. Um, this sponsor amendment is drafted to clarify intent and address the uh, concerns of the court. And so, Vice Chair Feldman and members of the committee, I ask for your favorable report as amended. You're on mute, Vice Chair. Thank you, Senator Augustine. Any questions for the sponsor, Senator Augustine? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're going to go to the next witness uh, who is part of the Senator's sponsor panel, Maura Cyphers. Maura, I see you in the House. Uh, you've got two minutes. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the Senate Finance Committee. Maura Cyphers with Compass Government Relations here on behalf of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, Maryland chapter. So, NAMI Maryland. Oh, oh you okay? Oh. Yeah, my computer fell off my books. Okay. We lost power at the office. Um, NAMI Maryland strongly supports Senate Bill 2. And thank you uh, to Senator Augustine for um, bringing this bill before the committee. I think there are a couple of things that, you know, NAMI and their family members uh, would want me to convey, which is that when mental illness is present for a family member, uh, particularly if they've already experienced trauma or crisis, the potential for crisis and emergencies is never far from mine. 
Um, and I think, you know, what is so critical about um, when an inv individual is experiencing a mental health crisis is that unlike other health emergencies, um, people facing mental health emergencies often have difficult time accessing those important and potentially life-saving services. And um, on occasion, that is where an emergency petition would come in. Um, emergency petitions or EPs are very process oriented. I think as part of your testimony packets, you should have two pages of how they work in Maryland um, visually to explain it. This bill, um, I think we'll just do a couple of, or one really important thing, which is um, getting that person who's experiencing crisis to immediate care. Um, and the weak point that Senator Augustine already identified is that um, reliance or requirement on the presence of a physically signed document, you know, this in the year 2022. So um, just bringing the emergency petition process into this century um, by permitting the use of digital signatures and can just ensure that individuals can be admitted into the hospital in a timely manner, um, cut down that the trauma and the waiting um, and just making sure that folks are, are able to access the treatment they need and, and um, families have kind of the greater certainty that the EP process is difficult as it can be to navigate um, is a little simpler. So for these reasons, NAMI asked for a favorable support, favorable report on Senate Bill 2. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, any questions for Ms. Cyphers? Seeing none, our next witness is um, Aaron Dorian. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Feldman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erin Dorian, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Policy uh, at the Maryland Hospital Association. Um, I want to thank Senator Augustine for um, working with our members and, bringing, and introducing this legislation uh, this year. We know emergency departments are on the front lines of the mental health crisis in the state and are often the provider of last resorts for individuals in a behavioral health crisis. Um, EDs are also the only facilities that can accept a patient for an emergency re evaluation required by an emergency petition. Uh, we're keenly aware of the long wait times patients can find can face in moving to their next level of care. Often this is due to capacity issues outside of the control of the health system, but there can be other reasons for delay. SP2 seeks to address some of the administrative inefficiencies in the emergency petition process. As you heard, uh, current law requires a paper copy of the emergency petition to follow the patient. Uh, this is out of step with, te with the technology available today and is even out of step with technology available yesterday like a fax machine. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have already moved to virtual hearings uh, for other steps in this process, um, but we have not updated the law around um, the emergency petition piece of paper. Uh, electronic transmission of emergency petition documents will align the process with the medical record um, and eliminate some of the administrative delays these patients may face. For these reasons, I, I hope the committee issues a favorable report on SB2. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Ms. Dorian? Okay, seeing none. Our next witness is Evelyn Burton. Evelyn, uh, unmute yourself. There you go, two minutes, Evelyn. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Evelyn Burton. I am the Volunteer Advocacy Chair for Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. We are primarily a fam support families with um, these serious mental illnesses. And we strongly support SB2. Um, some of the psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar um, have a neurological um, deficit, which prevents the individual from recognizing they have an illness and, and recognizing that they need treatment. And therefore sometimes involuntary evaluation and treatment is necessary. The research which I cite in my written testimony has shown that prompt treatment of psychosis is absolutely vital to prevent actual brain damage and in, to increase the prognosis of functional recovery. Um, the use of electronic submission, um, I think is especially important in the age of telemedicine where the mental health provider may not be in the, even in the same county. 
as the individual that they're treating. Um, also, facilitating uh, providers of mental health to submit these petitions is so important because families are very often reluctant to go to the court to do it themselves because they fear it will damage irreparably their relationship with their loved one. So facilitating the ability of mental health providers to do that is really important to, to the continuing the support from the family. So for all these reasons, we hope that uh, you will support and give a favorable report to SB2. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Burton. Any questions for uh, the witness, uh, Ms. Burton? Okay, I should have mentioned uh, that all the witnesses so far have signed up favorable. I should have made that note. The only other witness who signed up and has signed up unfavorable is uh, Vince McAvoy. Mr. McAvoy, um, you've got two minutes. I see you on the screen. Thank you so much, committee. I appreciate your time on this. Uh, I'm concerned about this bill. This is something that had been uh, a concept initially uh, forwarded by uh, Kathleen Vitale before she became a judge. And what we see is that these are, these can be concerning family events when we're presenting these things as medical issues or as psychological issues. Uh, what I'm hearing from the, the proponents of the bill is that they're saying, oh, these particular, these particular six hours matter. And we know that from medical issues, just the diagnosis, these things go on weeks, months, perhaps years. So the concern is not the streamlining of it, but we of course just had some upgrades done to the state's uh, case search and deck and other related that, that integrate in with these things. And so the question is, if someone has this kind of situation and is simply looking at electronic record, how do they, how do they address this issue when they're, they're not necessarily being taken uh, on, on their own voluntary will? Also, um, we have issues where if it's, if it's in, uh, incorrectly entered, how do these folks address it? We do have electronic record problems. We have been having it with MDEC. We do have docket entries that are, you know, put onto the wrong person. And then how do you address this electronically where everyone's just pointing to an electronic document? There's a grave amount of concern on this. Finally, in conclusion, I thank you for listening, Senators, that the, if we have something like this, how do we have it backstopped with a physical record that person who has, who's saying this is a mistake or I don't agree with this, how do they go ahead and address this in that kind of quick time frame, pictured on a weekend. This could be a very troubling matter when courts are closed. How do you get to a bench commissioner? All these type of things. So I urge an unfavorable. I think that, that we, we still need to remain even though we can transmit these things quickly. How do we undo them as quickly in the event of an error? Thank you. Okay, any questions for uh, Mr. McAvoy? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 2. We are going to next move to the third bill from Senator Augustine, Senate Bill 12. Um, Senator, we're on Senate Bill 12. It's all yours. Thank you, Vice Chair Feldman and members of the committee. Uh, Senator Malcolm Augustine presenting Senate Bill 12, uh, Behavioral Health Crisis Response Service and Public Service uh, on Public Safety Answer Points Modifications. Uh, colleagues, this is a follow-on bill um, to the bill uh, that you all passed last year around mobile crisis um, units, where we extended uh, and increased the funding for mobile crisis units. We also had uh, in that language, um, which was removed uh, on the House side, was information around these grant programs that we felt uh, was the best practice and also uh, would allow um, for law enforcement to uh, really be more involved in uh, matters that were not um, specific to um, uh, behavioral health crises. And how that worked was that we, we put into the legislation um, a, a, a requirement that the proposals for these grants for these um, mobile crisis units include response standards that minimize law enforcement interaction. And again, 
this was uh, in, in keeping with the idea of allowing law enforcement to um, really work in the areas that, that they need to work in, but provide additional resources um, for those people who are having a um, behavioral health crisis. And so we did that in this legislation and we uh, amend the definition of a mobile crisis team um, to reflect that, that, uh, that ultimate goal of diversion. This also, um, uh, this piece of legislation has a new element this year, which is that we know that the, um, that the 911 system and others like it, public safety answering points, are the first line uh, uh, often for where people are interacting um, with uh, our public safety personnel when they are having, uh, when they are uh, in and near a behavioral health crisis. And so what this says is that we need to develop written policies for those um, behavioral health crisis calls, um, which will uh, ultimately help when we have those written policies for transparency, um, for neighboring jurisdictions, so we're able to do a better job of coordinating in crisis response uh, and to provide uh, transparency to the public as well so that they uh, know what to expect um, when they are uh, making calls um, into these public safety answer points, particularly 911. And, and so with that in mind, uh, colleagues, I would ask um, for a favorable report on Senate Bill 12. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator. Any questions for the sponsor, Senator Augustine? <clears throat> okay, seeing none. Uh, the Senator has designated several witnesses as part of his favorable uh, sponsor panel. We're gonna start with uh, Maura Cyphers. Maura, um, you're gonna be first up. You get two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon again to the members of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, Maura Cyphers here on behalf of NAMI Maryland um, and in support of Senate Bill 12. I think Senator Augustine did a great job setting up the bill. It does two really important things. Um, it would require that local government mobile crisis teams minimize the role of law enforcement um, in crisis interactions and response, which will only serve to help strengthen the existing behavioral health crisis response grant program. Um, that you all you know, passed an increase for last year and, and for which we're very grateful. Um, and to ensure that Maryland is investing in programs and services that are really addressing mental health emergencies first. Um, this, this is a priority for NAMI Maryland um, because unfortunately we've seen it across the nation and, and Maryland's not unique, but deploying law enforcement service, law enforcement as sort of the first response for mental health crises is really, led to the criminalization of mental illness in Maryland. Um, and you know, nationwide, one in four people with a serious mental illness are arrested during their lives. Um, two in five adults in jail or prison have a diagnosed mental illness. For kids, the stats are worse. Seven in 10 um, kids in the juvenile justice system have a mental illness. And in 2019, which I believe is the most recent data available, one in four um, Americans killed by a police officer had a diagnosed mental illness. So um, those, those stats are hard to take. And I think we wanna make sure that the state is, is really helping local jurisdictions beef up um, their mental health crisis response. And there's a whole swath of models and services um, and ways to deploy it. So it's not so prescriptive that every county has to do the same thing. Um, but it's it's really helping us put those dollars towards mental health services. Um, and then the other thing that this bill does is help pave the way towards um, 988 implementation, which I think we're all excited about and is coming July 2022 um, by just asking the public safety access points to create a written protocol um, so that we know what happens when mental health crisis calls come in and we can see, okay, well, here's maybe the weak points or here's a good model, here's something we can replicate. Um, and then helping us also then to map out services so that Maryland can really work to build that comprehensive um, crisis response system that we need, we need to have in place. Um, so I think just in closing, NAMI believes that a well-designed crisis response system can be 
um, the difference between life and death for someone with a mental illness. Um, and so NAMI Maryland strongly supports this bill and we would ask for your favorable report on Senate Bill 12. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Ms. Cyphers? Okay, seeing none, our next witness is Dan Rabbit. Mr. Rabbit, I see you there. You've got two minutes. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Rabbit. I'm a policy director at Behavioral Health System Baltimore, BHSB. We are the local behavioral health authority for Baltimore City. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. BHSB is in strong support of SB 12. Uh, we see this as a common sense measure that will help advance efforts to reduce our reliance on police to respond to mental health crises, freeing up our critical law enforcement partners to do the job they signed up for rather than responding to mental health calls. Mental health crises happen, and unfortunately, they're on the rise. Uh, it's imperative to have effective crisis services for Marylanders experiencing things like suicidal thoughts, panic attacks, bipolar episodes, or other types of serious mental health symptoms. These services save lives. And law enforcement has a role to play as a partner within the crisis response system. This bill does not prevent that. But dispatching police is not needed for many mental health crises. We've seen this in other states that have reduced their use of police and crisis response by adopting different models. And we've seen this in the direction provided by national guidelines, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration uh, at the federal level, and uh, HSCRC funded regional catalyst grants that uh, BHSB received uh, is helping to implement one of them uh, called GBRICS. Um, but all of those different initiatives are moving in the direction of reducing our reliance on law enforcement personnel for mental health crises. In many cases, it's just not necessary to involve the police. And in speaking with individuals who have experienced a suicidal or mental health crisis, they report that police involvement can actually be counterproductive to resolving their crisis. Well-trained and well-meaning police still can be disruptive and intimidating and uh, can, are associated with uh, criminality and threats to public safety. At BHSB, we speak at, we've spoken with communities of people living with mental illness, living in underserved communities, and they do not associate law enforcement um, intervention with healing and support. We should listen to them when what they ask for is a mental health response for mental health challenges. This bill helps us head in that direction. Crisis response programs, and uh, the public safety answering points uh, within the 911 system should have standards for when to call in police, when to send mobile crisis teams or other mental health professionals, when to send both or have one on standby. It makes sense to have standards for when and how you involve these different parts of the system. And those standards should seek to offer the least forceful and disruptive response that can still resolve uh, the crisis safely and effectively. That's what this bill does, and we urge a favorable report. Okay, thank you. Any questions uh, for uh, the witness, uh, Mr. Rabbit? <clears throat> Seeing none, um, our next witness is uh, William Ferretti. Bill Ferretti, I see you in the, in the uh, Zoom call. You've got uh, two minutes, and you're also part of the favorable uh, panel, Senator Augustine's panel. I am. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Feldman and members of the Finance Committee. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Ferretti. I'm the former director of now one for Montgomery County, uh, now retired. I also had the pleasure to serve on the commission to advance next generation now one across Maryland uh, up until the time of my retirement. And I since have been uh, sitting the commission as an advisor. I, I am urging you uh, a favorable report on this Senate bill. And I wanna speak to the now one portion of it. A lot of the conversation during the hearing and also nationally has been about the relationship between law enforcement and mental and, and, and crisis intervention and maybe changing the balance of that. And from a, from a 911 perspective, I also wanna put on the plate that, call, that all our 911 centers in Maryland use a protocol-based triage system, and that is not law enforcement centric. And what's missing from the conversation, and while I'm, I, I'm supporting this bill, is because it generates a conversation. And that conversation needs to involve mental health, police, but it also needs to include fire and EMS. Because a lot of these calls are triaged as fire EMS calls, then the police are sent in support of fire EMS, but what the public sees is the police arriving first. So therefore they dictate that as a law enforcement call. 
So really this is a, it's important that the conversation takes place involving all of the public safety community-based providers. Um, because really the way we provide um, public safety in Maryland and the way it's done across the country is at the neighborhood level, the neighborhood police officer, the neighborhood EMS uh, providers. And I, you know, one day perhaps we'll get to the point where there's actually a, a neighborhood um, you know, um, crisis intervention team, mobile crisis team available to go with them in a task force type of environment. I think finally, um, while, I, while I'm supporting this bill, because I think it's important that the 911 center have those conversations with the overall community, that those conversations are transparent. And that at the end of the day, the whole community to include citizens have realistic expectations about who's gonna be responding. And sometimes as some of the previous um, speakers have mentioned, it is going to include the police because it is appropriate because there's a threat, but it doesn't have to be all the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Mr. Reddy? Uh, just on a personal note, I, I wanna say that uh, before he retired, uh, Mr. Ferretti gave me a personal tour of our 911 operation uh, in Montgomery County. It was impressive. I learned a lot. And congratulations, Bill, on your on your retirement. I think you did a great job for Montgomery County. Um, Thank you, Senator. Next witness is Natalie Busath, who also is part of uh, Senator Augustine's panel. Uh, thank you, Chair Kelly, Vice Chair Feldman, and members of the committee. My name is Natalie Busaith. I'm a health policy intern with Johns Hopkins, and I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 12. For years, I worked on call as a legal and medical advocate for survivors of abuse. And what that usually looked like was responding to dispatch as quickly as possible, meeting them in the emergency room and giving that person in crisis a roadmap for what might happen next. And I can't tell you how powerful that is. I'm also speaking from personal experience, from the times I've had to call 911 for myself or for loved ones experiencing a mental health crisis. Sometimes I got the help I needed, sometimes I didn't, but it always felt like a gamble. Not knowing what comes next after making that call is what always made me hesitate, and I know I'm not alone. That is exactly what this bill seeks to prevent, because I know where that hesitation leads. It makes those who are in the most need the hardest to reach. I think everyone here knows how difficult it is to make decisions quickly when those decisions have enormous consequences. You're doing that right now in a public health emergency, no less. And to do that well, you need to have all the information you can get on what might happen and who might be affected. And without publicly accessible information on how behavioral health calls are triaged, what, res what resources are available, including when and where they're available, and how dispatch dis decisions are made, advocates like me are guiding people in crisis in the dark. So Senate Bill 12 just shines a light on those procedures. And in doing so, the procedures themselves can be improved in the process. And for these reasons, I'm asking for a favorable report of Senate Bill 12. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Your testimony. Any questions for uh, Ms. Boussaint? Hi, Senator Feldman, I have my hand raised. There you go, Senator Augustine. Yeah, uh, it, it's not so much a, a question, but it is an acknowledgement um, to the committee of um, Ms. Boussath, who is a uh, intern in my office, helping with the behavioral health aspects that you all know I work on. And she is doing an amazing job and has given to our committee today of herself. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that and her contributions to, um, to my office and to the state of Maryland. Okay, well said. I think you speak for everybody here on the committee, uh, Senator Augustine. Any um, any additional questions or comments for for our witness? Okay, seeing none. Our our next witness is Ann Seacott. Um, Ms. Seacott, you got two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon again. I'm Ann Seacott, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the Maryland affiliate of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Um, we are here in strong support of Senate Bill 12. Increasing the number of behavioral health crisis services, including walk-in crisis centers and 24-hour mobile crisis teams is going to help. Simultaneously reducing police presence will help people get the services they need and avoid unnecessary incarceration and emergency room visits. These kinds of services can be used when people are experiencing a mental health or a substance use disorder crisis or both. 
The failed war on drugs has created a great deal of mistrust among police, um, um, mis mistrust of police among various communities, including people who use drugs. The General Assembly has for a number of years now uh, worked on policies to try to uh, address some of that by passing a Good Samaritan law back in 2014 that is meant to protect people when they call for help when someone's experiencing a drug or alcohol emergency uh, by passing last year a bill to decriminalize uh, paraphernalia so that people uh, are, are able to more freely participate in syringe service programs. Um, this philosophy hopefully will hold true soon uh, in, in, within the next few years um, as Maryland hopefully follows the lead of New York City and Rhode Island in authorizing overdose prevention sites. All of these things really are connected uh, to making people be able to access the services they need and have us as a state be able to appropriately use resources where they're needed. Police are needed in very many situations. They're not needed in all of them. And we support this bill to encourage um, this direction continue when it comes to behavioral health needs. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions for Ms. Seacott? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna go next to uh, signed up favorable with amendment uh, is Paul Nibber from, um, from MAKO. Paul? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the committee. Um, sorry, I also must acknowledge the chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is DePaul Nibber, representing the Maryland Association of Counties in support of SB 12 with amendment. Uh, county law enforcement are often involved with mental health crisis response. We detail uh, certain situations where this may be the case in our written testimony. In short, law enforcement may be needed after hours when other agencies are overextended or short staffed and to ensure the safety of crisis response workers. To be clear, we agree with many who have testified a mental health crisis necess necessitates a measured response with trained professionals capable of de-escalation and the appropriate resources on hand. Understanding that law enforcement could play a role in this response, we have offered a friendly amendment in our written testimony. As opposed to requiring behavioral health uh, crisis response grant program applicants to minimize law enforcement involvement, our amendment would require applicants to detail and appropriately manage said involvement. Many counties provide crisis training to law enforcement, and despite the best efforts to divert calls, Law enforcement will be directed to scenes potentially involving a mental health crisis. Understanding the potential for these situations to arise, counties should not be excluded from receiving crisis response grants as they think through how to shift the burden of crisis response to their crisis response teams. For these reasons, we urge a favorable with amendments report for SB 12. Okay, Mr. Nibber, thank you for your testimony. Questions um, for the witness? And Sarah Augustine, witness represented there was a friendly amendment. Is that just for the benefit of the committee? Is that an accurate representation? Uh, friendly with respect to you or friendly? I just to clarify. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not. This is not. This is. Uh, I have not seen the amendment. Okay. I'm looking at it. I'm willing to take a look at it, but I, I was not reached out to prior to the. Uh, okay. The so it, it it may be friendly. It may not be friendly, Mr. Nip to sponsor the bill, uh, you know, it's the first stop for, for, for an amendment that's proffered. But in any event, uh, we'll, we'll find that out uh, subsequently. Any additional questions for, uh, for the witness? Okay, uh, seeing none, we have one witness signed up unfavorable and it's um, Mr. McAvoy, uh, Vince McAvoy. Um, let's see if we can find Mr. McAvoy here. You see me there? There you go. Okay, we got you, Mr. Mack. All right. You signed up unfavorable, and you've got two minutes. Great. Well, thank you so much, committee, for listening again. I appreciate it. My concern with this bill is that we have an overt statement where we are trying to de-emphasize police involvement as annotated code, written into the code. Now, if, if we have that as a as a on the field manual, if we has that have that as an acting policy with our various uh, police departments, that's one thing. We certainly don't want to misapply the resources. And, and incidentally, I think this, when we when we talk about 
police departments being overtaxed, uh, we should probably increase hiring. That would probably help. What I think is very, is, is off the mark on this bill is that when you look at a, a great variety of situations which can rapidly de-escalate into violence, we frequently do have mental illness involved. In fact, when you look at those who are in prison, they fall 60%. 60% are classified as mentally ill. So this is not an issue of we have mental illness over here and we have criminality over here. They are interchanged, they are integrally linked and integrally linked to the point where we have no choice but to incarcerate when we have issues of violence. This also applies when we have issues of drugs. When, when do we see domestic violence? When do we see child abuse? These are drug related matters. That means that police should be involved because they have to parse this up. They have to parse it out determining whether we have neglect, whether we have abuse, whether we have an ongoing issue, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, while there are times, like I say, that we don't need police involved with these, um, we wanna think about where are they gonna be left in the city? Uh, if they have a problem at say 1100 North Charles Street, they could have a problem a couple blocks over on Biddle Street. So it's not always like we're sending them out to the yonder and they're, they're not gonna be able to apply to other calls. Um, these issues are linked. We should not be trying to have any written policy where we're trying to ensconce police from coming to the scene until we figure out what is the actual issue. When we have a report that dispatches merit it needs police involvement. I thank the committee for its time. Okay, thank you for your testimony, Mr. McAvoy. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, that uh, concludes our testimony on Senate Bill uh, 12, and we're gonna now move to the final bill of today is Senate Bill 28, and it's uh, Chair Kelly's bill. So uh, Chair Kelly, I'm gonna yield to you and you can take as much time as you want to explain Senate Bill 28. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair, members. Um, Senate Bill 28, the Maryland, uh, deals with the Maryland Medicaid home and community-based service options. Right now, the waiver that we have is designed to help certain disabled Marylanders who meet income guidelines to receive assistance in their homes with bathing, dressing, toileting, uh, eating, and with management of their medis medicines. The problem in Maryland is that the waiting list of eligible registrants is over 22,000 persons, and the wait for service is about eight years for any given individual. This long waiting list exists because the HCBOW, the, this waiver, is not required to meet the service demand. Maryland is therefore operating in a court, not in accordance with federal standards nor with uh, up to our own level of need. In 1999, the United States Supreme Court held that individuals of any age who have disabilities have an inalienable right to receive state-funded long-term services and supports in the community rather than in institutions, Olmstead v. Zimring. Maryland's current state plan on aging states that one of our primary goals is to quote, finance and coordinate high quality service that supports individuals with long-term care needs in a home or community setting, but we're not functioning that way. Home and community-based care make financial sense as well as being uh, more operationally sound. Maryland is currently benefiting from an enhanced federal match because of our recent federal financial relief packages. The CARES Act bumped, uh, 6 .2, uh, bumped up what we had 6.2% on the, uh, in terms of funds that are available uh, for the circumstances of people who need uh, healthcare in the community because they're elderly, disabled, and because they prefer not to be institutionalized. While it is time limited, those enhanced match funds could be used 
to cover any short-term increase in cost until savings are realized from decreased nursing home costs. Elena Salito Esquire, president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, Maryland, D.C. chapter, will be explaining in depth the budgetary benefits to the state of Maryland from passing this bill. Other states that have expanded uh, these services have saved tens to hundreds of millions of dollars by allowing disabled people to get the care they need in their own home instead of placing them in a nursing home, which in most cases would reflect their own, um, uh, their own um, preferences. Senate Bill 28 will solve long-term issues with Maryland's home and community-based options waiver program by requiring a cap on waiver participation of not fewer than 7,500. Next, by requiring the department to establish a plan for waiver participation of not fewer than 7,500. Requiring the department to send a waiver application to at least 600 individuals on the waiver wait list or registry per month. In other words, you don't let people just pile up. Uh, you're moving along at a preordained uh, rate or pace so that you know who ought to be next in line and who has been waiting the longest. And by requiring the department to clearly and conspicuously state when the application must be submitted and when eligibility criteria must be met. I'm submitting for your consideration committee the following amendment, a requirement that the department apply to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for an amendment to the home and community-based waiver, because I'm believing they should do it and asking them to actually do it and the bill is important. This would increase the waiver cap size to be consistent with the um, parameters of this act. I've also submitted uh, a co-sponsor request to add Senator Joanne Benson, who'd like to join the other co-sponsors on this bill. And I'm asking for your favorable report on Senate Bill 28. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions for Chair Kelly? Senate Bill 28. Okay, seeing none, uh, we've got, the chair has designated several witnesses to be part of her sponsor panel. We're gonna start with um, Alina Salido. Um, Ms. Salido. Uh, th th thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Kelly, for being such a champion of this for so long and for your tireless efforts. Um, uh, my name is Elena Salido. I am an elder law attorney uh, practicing uh, out of Annapolis. And I'm also the chair of the Maryland DC chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Uh, we represent a group of professionals that uh, represent seniors and their families. Um, when the legislature enacted um, Health General 15-132, which established the Home and Community-Based Options Waiver Program, it, it uh, envisioned a very robust program. And the legislation says there shall be an initial uh, number of slots of 7,500. Um, unfortunately, the vision has not quite translated into the reality. And as we sit here, as Senator Kelly said, there are well over 21,000 people sitting at home waiting for an invitation to apply to a program that would provide the necessary assistance with bathing or hygiene or dressing that would enable somebody to age at home with dignity um, rather than being forced into an institution. Um, instead of expanding the program, uh, the Department of Health has a history of looking to constrict the number of um, slots it seeks uh, from uh, CMS. And uh, there is an amendment to my um, written statement that shows the history of the ever decreasing number of slots that the department seems to um, want to uh, create for this. Um, 
I was looking at the uh, fiscal note and I did want to uh, I, I just take note of a curious statement that's in there. And it says on page two, uh, the author says that currently applicants who get the invitations are permitted nine weeks within which to return the waiver application as opposed to six weeks that we're asking for in the legislation. Um, I'm not sure where the author got this information um, because any correspondence I've seen from the department gives the applicants three weeks to come up with volumes of information and say, if you don't get it to, it, to us within this time limit, your application is going to be dropped. Um, I did want a quick note about uh, cost savings uh, with this program, and there are substantial cost savings. Um, in uh, the Hilltop uh, Institute that did an economic analysis on expanding the waiver program last, I believe it was last year, um, said that for every dollar spent on the waiver program, there is a corresponding reduction of anywhere from 16 to 44% of dollars spent on nursing home um, expenses through Medicaid. And I think that's a really, really significant number that people need to appreciate. Um, and I don't believe that cost offset is reflected in the fiscal note. Um, what is uh, reflected in the fiscal note though at page four is that there may be sufficient funding in the budget this year to cover the cost to comply with this bill in fiscal 2023, which is nice. Hilltop established that um, to fully take care of everybody on the waiting list who would be eligible for services once they applied, we would need about 30 to $39 million, that's it. Um, and that does not account for the corresponding um, uh, uh, savings on the other side. Uh, I wanna point out that there's a cost to not having um, a viable uh, waiver program, uh, both to employers and to caregivers. Uh, people are routinely taking FMLA leave. Uh, they are quitting their jobs in an effort to take care of people uh, at home. So this is a burden that is on employers and on the caregivers. And it's also a burden that falls disproportionately on women. Um, so not only is this a civil rights issue, um, as uh, Senator Kelly mentioned, it's also a women's issue as well as a healthcare issue. Um, people in nursing homes are forced away from their family and friends. Uh, they go into a situation where they share a room with uh, a roommate that they have virtually no control over who it is, when it is. Um, they have a single bed. They have a nightstand. Uh, they may have a TV. They have a locker. And that's where they keep their clothing. Uh, they are on the institution's time clock. If they're lucky, they'll get two showers a week. They eat institutional food. Um, and the only crime for this, for, for this um, putting them into this facility is that they got old and they needed some care. And it's very easy as we're sitting here to forget that the, peop the people in the nursing homes because they have no voice themselves. But we do need to remember that these are the people that raised families and built businesses and fought for our wars and gave back to the community. They are our grandparents, they're our parents, they are siblings, and ultimately they are us. And we need to do better, um, not just for them, but also for ourselves. And I just want to thank you for your time and uh, invite any questions you may have. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Any, um, yeah, get some back. Any questions uh, for the witness, Ms. Salito? Okay, uh, seeing none, we're gonna to go to the next witness, uh, Tiffany Love Rivers, also part of Chair Kelly's panel, uh, favorable. Ms. Ms. Rivers? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Vice, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Senator Kelly and members of the Senate Finance Committee. You might hear my voice is a little raspy right now because waiting to speak in this session, my mom set off the fire alarms and this house is actually filled with smoke. Um, <clears throat> my name is Tiffany Love Rivers. I'm here in support on behalf of my mom, Gail Love. She has cognitive impairment due to dementia, the likely result of a brain aneurysm she had the week that I was born. I am also the result of caring for her mother before she passed. My mom has no valuable assets. I bought my home nearly four years ago to care for my mom, but I cannot afford to also pay for home care. I have been on FMLA leave actually for several months now to care for her full time. Prince George's County is one of the wealthiest black counties in the country, and yet the Medicaid waiting list is the worst, or one of the worst. The lack of effective process affects working families struggling to provide care and 
still be able to pass down assets and generational wealth. I applied to the Medicaid waiver option through Access Point nearly three years ago. In two and a half years, we received no correspondence. And in fact, I was never informed that we were placed on a wait list at all. I thought the questionnaire that I completed with Maryland Access Point was the Medicaid application. With pro bono support from Susie, who's speaking, and Elena, who just spoke, we were finally invited to apply in October. The first letter I received explaining the process and services that I would receive was after we applied in October, after the fact. Maryland has six months to process that application. While in this session, they emailed that since the cyber attack, they have no access to their programs and there's no confirmation that they will meet that six month deadline. I run out of paid FMLA six weeks before Med Maryland's deadline. And I'm hearing Maryland is behind on those applications by several months already. This may force me to relocate from Maryland. Alternatively, Rhode Island office, Medicaid office, whose staff are also working from home, does not have a wait list and are processing applications in 30 to 90 days. It would be very disruptive for me to have to move somebody with dementia, but my employer now does allow remote work. If Maryland had met their obligations in a timely manner, our family would not be in this situation. I've had no help for years and we're still waiting. I want to add that to Elena's statement that nursing homes also are not allowing visitors right now and somebody with dementia will decline very quickly without family visitation. I ask that you support Senate Bill 28 and I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your testimony, Ms. Rivers. Any questions for, for Ms. Rivers? Okay, seeing none, um, our next witness is Susie Murphy. Ms. Murphy. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Kelly. We really appreciate uh, your support of this bill. My name is Susie Elder Murphy, and I'm the owner of Deborah Levy Elder Care Associates, an aging life care management company that's been in business in Maryland for nearly 34 years. Today, I'm not only testifying as a business owner and full-time care manager, but also on behalf of our professional association, Aging Life Care Association, and I also submitted written testimony as I've been in this field for so long, I can actually remember when the Medicaid waiver was first introduced and I was actually successful in getting a waiver for one of my clients named Ellie. Little did I know at that time that that would be the one and only time that I would be able to get a waiver for one of our clients. We get calls every week from families and they want to know what they should do for their mom or their dad or their grandparent or their spouse because they're running out of money and they can't, uh, like Tiffany said, they can't work full time and care for a relative who needs care. And I've been listening to all of the testimony today since one o'clock and I was thinking, you know, it's amazing how many people that you've heard from about um, the mental health issues, which are very important and the Medicaid dental, which is very important. And I thought, why don't we have, you know, 20, witnesses here testifying about this Medicaid waiver when we have almost 22,000 people waiting for it. And the reason we don't, I think is pretty simple. Those families have this narrow window. They're running out of money and they're running out of time. And they've either moved out of the state or their family member has passed or they've moved them into a skilled nursing facility and then they've moved on with their lives. So I think you haven't heard from all of these 22,000 families because they don't have the time to, to be here and to testify. And, and I greatly admire Tiffany for all she's done. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Murphy, for your testimony. Any questions for Ms. Murphy? And I should note that all the witnesses who are uh, testifying orally today are testifying uh, favorable or signed up favorable just so everybody knows if I didn't make that point. Um, going to our next witness, Mary Aquino. Ms. Aquino? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Vice yes. Chair. Two minutes. Uh, good, af good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Aquino, and I'm a senior attorney for elder law at Maryland Legal Aid. Um, I would like to thank Madam Chair, Senator Kelly, for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate Bill 28. 
Maryland Legal Aid is a private nonprofit that provides free legal services to low-income residents across the state. We are particularly interested in this bill because we work helping older adults and people with disabilities with Medicaid eligibility issues. I agree with uh, statements made by the prior witnesses, so I'm going to try to keep my comments brief. Um, Maryland Legal Aid has clients who've been waiting for years for an invitation to apply for the waiver. Unfortunately for those clients, the only way to bypass the waiting list is to sign themselves into a nursing home. And when they're found eligible for medical assistance as a nursing home resident, they can apply for the waiver to return to the community. This process can take over six months. It just doesn't make sense for someone to have to go into a nursing home to access a program such as the waiver, which is designed to keep them out of a nursing home. Maryland Legal Aid supports Senate Bill 28 since it requires the department to invite at least 600 individuals on the registry each month to apply for the waiver. By doing so, more people would be able to access the waiver services. It would increase the number of approved slots to 7,500. It would quickly fill over 2,000 unused slots it would reduce the number of people on the waiting list and it would reduce the amount of time people must wait. Most importantly, it would fulfill the purpose of the waiver program, which is to allow older adults and people with disabilities to continue living in the community with the essential support of family, friends, and caregivers rather than in an institution. We ask that you give Senate Bill 28 a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Any, que any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the next witness, Morris Klein. Mr. Klein? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, and you've got two minutes, Mr. Klein. All right, thank you. So good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you in particular, Madam Chair, in particular for your work on this bill as well as your support for legislation over the years to improve the care of the elderly and the disabled. My name is Morris Klein. I'm an attorney in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Elder Law and Disability Rights Section of the Maryland State Bar Association, whose 500 plus members, attorneys representing primarily senior and disabled adults. I've also submitted written testimony on behalf of my organization. It becomes increasingly likely as one ages, one needs to help with activities of daily living. Some say that one in two at, by the age of 85 need some type of care for this. The holy grail is to age in place, to live in dignity in your home and not be institutionalized. Not only is it preferable, but in the age of COVID, it is safer than risking exposure to uh, various other people in an institutional setting. Maryland, like other states, as what's called a waiver of the requirement that long-term care services under Medicaid must be in a nursing home to allow to receive benefits at home or in assisted living. While Maryland rightly is proud to be, a prog to be progressive in many healthcare policies, it falls short when offering persons the chance to age in place at home instead of a nursing home. The approximately over 20,000 persons on the waiting list, last I checked, is one of the highest in the country. Most other states have managed to have smaller waiting lists and to expand home and community-based waiver services. This bill will make a significant and positive improvement in the quality of life of persons who need help with activities of daily living, but who are still able and want to remain at home. Um, I urge that you give this bill a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Klein. I don't know if you know you were not on camera. I don't know if you intended that to be the case, but I just wanted to make sure. No, you... that was a mistake. Sorry. Okay, about that. that's okay. Um, any questions for Mr. Klein? Okay, seeing none, none, our next witness is Dana Kaufman. Ms. Kaufman. Dana's not in the meeting. Okay, Dana's not in the meeting. We're going to go to the next witness, Eric Kulchamaro. Uh, 
the Alzheimer's Association. Eric. Chair Kelly and Vice Chair Feldman. Uh, my name is Eric Colchmero, Director of Government Affairs of the Alzheimer's Association in Maryland, and here today to ask for your support of SB 28. Um, you have my written testimony, and I would just say broadly, uh, the concerns raised by this legislation are not new to anyone on this committee. Yet what is new is that Maryland has a record budget surplus this year. This legislation must be a priority as we consider our fiscal year 2023 policy priorities, and specifically the Alzheimer's Association applauds the bill language to have no fewer than 7,500 people receiving services. This legislation would be a significant improvement to Maryland's broken home and community-based services system, where roughly 4,500 people are reserving services and close to 24,000 are waiting. The Alzheimer's Association urges the legislature to prioritize this bill and fix this historic injustice to Marylanders in need. The Washington Post wrote about this issue in October 2021, and I've attached that to my testimony, and wrote about how most Maryland home and community-based services applicants go to nursing homes or die before they hear from the health department. The same article talks about how the department is going through as many applicants as their resources will allow. It's time to devote more resources to this program. Maryland spent about 18% of its Medicaid dollars on older adults and people with disabilities in home and community-based care in 2017 and 2018, ranking 33rd in the country for home and community-based services. We can do better. I ask for your help to prioritize this issue advance the legislation, and I urge you as well to talk with your colleagues in the House uh, about prioritizing this bill as well. We have a rainy day fund for moments like this, where during a pandemic, seniors, including the 110,000 Marylanders with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, need help more than ever to stay in the community and age in place. I know a number of organizations have spoken today. I know the Maryland Senior Citizen Advocacy Network is also in support, and the Alzheimer's Association is here today to urge a favorable report. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any, any questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, our next witness is Aaron Greenfield. Um, yeah, good afternoon, <clears throat> Ms. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Aaron Greenfield here on behalf of Leading Age Maryland, which is a community of not-for-profit aging services organizations serving residents and clients through continuing care retirement communities, affordable senior housing, nursing homes, and community-based services. We are here in strong support of Senate Bill 28. You have our written testimony and I'll be brief. As healthcare shifts towards more creative and holistic models of care, there are opportunities for healthcare providers and home community-based services to work together to achieve a common goal of maintaining older Americans' health and enabling them to gracefully age in place at home with familiar surroundings and family. Approximately 20% of older adults currently utilize these services, uh, but our goal should be much higher as you uh, just heard from Mr. Colchimero in the Washington Post article, there's a 25,000 person wait list and it's an eight year period of time. Home and community based services waivers, education and increased accessibility of these services provide a bridge for less fortunate, providing seniors and caregivers specific resources, as well as general assistance with housing, finances, nutrition and home safety. With the rapid aging of our population, even as overall health improves, and healthcare costs continue to rise exponentially. The number of older adults who benefit from home and community-based services is expected to increase significantly in the coming years. Providing and expanding these programs and availability to less fortunate older adults, decrease and work to bend the curve of unnecessary hospital stays and inflated medical costs this should be all of our goal. For these reasons, we respectfully request a favorable report for, House, for Senate Bill 28. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Greenfield. Any questions for uh, Mr. Greenfield? Seeing none, which takes us to the final witness for this bill and for the day, Elizabeth Wegline. Ms. Wegline, uh, you've got, you play cleanup for the entire day here. Thank you. Well, the, thank you very much, Vice Chair, for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the United Seniors of Maryland. 
as well as the Elizabeth Cooney Care Network, which is a 65-year-old home and community-based service for consumer-directed caregiving in the home. Uh, you've had eloquent uh, experts be able to speak about this with all the stats. I speak on behalf really of the, of the seniors and their voice um, and their needs. They're better and they are served in the home in a healthy manner and they can age in place and they can save the state money overall by not going into facilities, going into the hospital and remaining at home and uh, with, with ADLs, activities of daily living. Um, uh, personally, I'm appointed to the uh, community options. So I actually help work with the state to create this waiver from the start. I oversee and sit on the advisory council that actually sees the numbers day, day in, day out. We have an excellent team within the Maryland Department of Health overseeing the home and community-based program. Their wherewithal and their bandwidth can sustain this expansion of requiring that they have at least 600 applicant applications um, sent out each month. There are enough providers within, and we're also transitioning into programs where individuals can hire their own family members as well as their own providers. Um, we urge a very favorable report, and we thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Ms. Wegline? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing, um, Senate Bill 28 and the bill hearings for today. I will send it back to you, Madam Chair, if you have any uh, closing comments before we adjourn. Uh, you've done a great job and I'm glad that all of our committee members were here today to really hear about the pressing problems expressed by all four of these uh, initiatives. We need your help. And if there's anybody who wants to sign on, uh, I'm sure uh, Senator Augustine doesn't mind having additional uh, signs uh, if you uh, are interested. Thanks so very much. And thanks to all of the persons who have testified. It's been very enlightening. Yeah, I think that's a wrap in the hearings for today. We are hereby as a Senate